Now, now, Lane, if you did that in combination with protein, would that be a better strategy to hit it at both ends where you would reduce degradation and increase synthesis? And is that an argument for combining carbohydrate and protein after a resistance training as opposed to just protein? So here's where it gets very complicated because there probably is some degradation that is needed in order to remodel and actually mm. make things better. Um, however, really we need to go to the kind of the hard outcome studies. So there's only really two studies I know of that examined like a protein and calorie equated um, low carbohydrate diet versus a protein calorie equated non low carbohydrate diet. And it was, a, it was ketogenic. So they measured blood ketones and, and saw they went up. Um, and this was, I think, 12 weeks. It was by a, somebody, uh, uh, Vargas was the author. Okay. And they did see less lean body mass accrual in the ketogenic diet group. Now, they still increased lean body mass. That's important to note. Um, but the group that was getting carbohydrate or more carbohydrates had more lean body mass. Now, the caveat to that is carbohydrates have make you store glycogen. So was it just water or was it contractile tissue? Now, in the second study, they did see a difference in uh, like one rep max squat and I think bench press as well. So that kind of suggests that perhaps there is something different in terms of actual contractile tissue, but this is an area that's gonna need to be studied a lot more. And again, I don't want anybody to straw man what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't build muscle on a ketogenic diet. You absolutely can. You can probably build a really good amount of muscle, but can you build as much as if you're including carbohydrate? Possibly not. And it may have something to do with carbohydrates effect or insulin's effect on blunting muscle protein breakdown. The other thing I'll add to that, again, based on my experience, and, and you've probably talked about this with Dom, is I think one of the challenges of studying ketogenic diets is the length of time it takes to adapt to them. Um, I, I went on a ketogenic diet in May of 2011 as an experiment, and I was committed to doing it for 12 weeks. And uh, I mean, five weeks in, I, had, I was so miserable. My wife was like, what are you doing and why? And you know, you know, all the standard mistakes I was making and, and the first being I made no reduction in training volume and I was already training at the level of a maniac, right? So, I mean, ridiculous training volume and I made zero reduction in it. And I was, I mean, just staggeringly and upsettingly miserable. And at 12 <laughs> weeks, I finally crested the first hill, which was the aerobic hill. So at the time it was cycling and swimming were the two sports. And I, at 12 weeks, I just got to the point where I could get my aerobic base back to where it was 12 weeks earlier. But anaerobically, I was nowhere near what I was 12 weeks earlier. Um, I won't put you on the spot and make you guess, but if I were gonna make you guess, how long do you, well, first of all, I decided to stay with the diet because I became so interested in the physiology of it. Um, and I wanted to see like, what is it gonna take to return back to my previous level of anaerobic fitness? It took 18 months. And I wanna be clear, this is 18 months without one day of deviation. Um, I would end up staying on this diet for three years with one day of deviation. My, my wife's birthday, I ended up having a bunch of cake. But, um, for three years to stay on this one, in, you know, incredibly restrictive diet, um, it took half of that period of time just to get back to where I was anaerobically. Um, so it speaks to how difficult I think it is to study any of this stuff. And, and by the way, was I perfectly controlling my exercise during that period of time? No, it's quite possible that some of those changes had to do with other variables. So, um, I don't know. I, sometimes I just think this, this stuff is so complicated. We should, we should focus on the biggest picture questions and, and try to get at them. But then there's times when we get into discussions like this and I'm like, no, these details are the most interesting part of this, right? Um, especially on this side of the equation, because this is, this is an area I know so little about. That's why I was very excited to, to discuss it with you. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, for, for the majority of the audience, I think that, and that's why I try to provide so much context when I talk about this stuff. And I, 
I don't talk about the ketogenic diet study and also not say, hey, you can still build muscle on it, right? Because I don't want people to take away, Lane said you can't build muscle on a ketogenic diet. And then they go out and they see somebody who built a bunch of muscle and they go, okay, well, this doesn't make sense, right? So I think that's why the, the, the nuance is very important. Like you said, we're, we're in the details, right? Because that's what's interesting to us because we kind of hopefully know some of the, like the major things, right? It's the same as testosterone, yeah. right? You could say the same thing. You'd be like, do you need to take exogenous t testosterone to be a bodybuilder? Nope. Look at all the examples. But if your goal is to be the biggest, the strongest, I have news for you. Go and get yourself t some testosterone cypionate and get ready to start smacking a thousand milligrams every single week. I mean, that's the reality <laughs> of it, you know. So, um, yeah. and again, that that's spoken without prejudice. It's simply biochemistry. Yeah. And an anecdote plays into this. An anecdote is important, and, and I'm about to discuss yours a little bit. But I always tell people, like, be just be be cautious with anecdote. I'm not saying that your anecdote doesn't matter, but what I am saying is everyone knows somebody who smoked every single day of their life till they were 90, right. right? And lived to a ripe old age. Does that mean that it's okay to smoke or do we think that's the best thing for longevity? We certainly do not, right? right? So when we're, when we're making broad recommendations, we're doing that based on the consensus of the evidence. But we, un we also need to understand that there will be outliers that fall outside that. And that's where you know individualization comes in. So I think one of the things that we really are struggling with right now, and I, I kind of challenged the low carb community on this a while back because one of my pet peeves is, I'm not saying that there's not such a thing as a ketogenic adaptation or fat adaptation that may take longer. What I'm saying is we need a, a hard metric for it. We, we really need some kind of hard metric to explain this because if we look at things like, okay, let's look at, Blood ketones. Yeah, it's clearly well, not that. Days, yeah, yeah. Really. It's clearly not blood right. ketones. It's not lipolysis. It's not. I mean, my only regret. Right. Because and we see fat oxidation. Fat oxidation within six yeah. days. No, is no. It's it's out, none so. of the things that we understand. I mean, it, my biggest regret about the experiment I did, because I'm never going to be repeating it, is I wish at the time. I had the thought and wherewithal to have taken muscle biopsies and collected, you know, ample amounts of tissue for all the future proteomics, meta metabolomics, every omic you can think of yeah. to have been done down the line. It still would have only been an N of one, but to me, yeah. if there, if that 18 month transition was something beyond psychological, and let's be honest, it could have been psychological too, right? Um, could have been, yeah. If it was anything other than psychological, I suspect the answer is far deeper than in any of the things that typically get talked about. Yeah, so I think if I was going to explain your kind of 18 months to get back to anaerobic, right? So first off, I think it's important to note that when it comes to when it comes to exercise, there's some diverging information in terms of the ketogenic diet or low carb diet, whether or not it's 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 bad for exercise. I think we can pretty conclusively say that for ultra endurance, there doesn't seem to be a downside to it. It also doesn't seem to be superior. It kind of boils down to personal preference and what the person likes. Um, when it comes to aerobic exercise, at least from what I've seen, if you're under 60% of your VO2 max, you're probably safe uh, in terms of getting the most out of your exercise after you're yep. um, fat adapted. When it comes to over 70%, that's where we start to get into where it becomes much more difficult to perform well or as optimally as you can on a ketogenic. And of course, yes, if you, like somebody sent me something and said, well, look at Sean Baker. He's deadlifting 500 pounds for nine reps and he's 50 years old. You know, like, how do you explain that? And I said, okay, again, this is why we have randomized control trials because I'm not saying that he's not strong and I'm not saying that you can't get strong and that you can't do some heavy weights for higher reps. What I, the question you need to ask yourself is, is he as strong as he possibly could have been if he was doing something different? Because just the sheer magnitude of resistance training consistently for a long period of time, you will get very strong. It doesn't matter what diet you're on. You will get strong um, or relatively yeah, strong yeah. for what you started yeah. at. Um, so the question always has to be, are we talking about, can you do something? Or was this the best thing that you could possibly do? Because those are two different questions, right? It's like when people talk about how much protein do I need? Well, you only need about 50 grams a day if we're talking about preventing you from uh, being in a negative nitrogen balance. But what's optimal for health or lean body mass? So that's a very different question, right? 
So I, I think that when, I guess if I could implore the listeners, just always remember that when you, when you see something that you think contradicts or you, that you think is, it doesn't fit, what is the person saying? Are they talking about optimizing or are they talking about, can you actually do this? Because if somebody says, well, you can't get strong in a ketogenic diet, I'd say, well, you're, you're an idiot. Of course you can, right? I mean, look at Dom. Yeah. <laughs> Dom, I, I see the man, I've seen him deadlift 700, to, 700 pounds multiple times with no carbohydrate intake, right? So it's obviously not true. The other thing I always encourage people to think about on this front is the relative to what comparison, which is a slight variation on what you said. So I know you had a great video out there, which we'll link to on critiquing the documentary Game Changers, which uh, unfortunately I just think was such a horrible, horrible uh, piece of propaganda. And I say that not as someone who's against a plant-based diet, I think much like you, but someone who is very much against disgusting science. And I found that to be a demonstration of utter nonsense. Um, but you know, when we wrote something about this, uh, one of the comments was, or one of the points we tried to make was, you know, one of the biggest challenges of studying nutrition in general is what are you comparing it to? And if you compare diet X to the standard American diet, almost by definition, diet X is going to look amazing because the standard American diet is such an awful diet. And I, I, I just, you know, I thought it was such an insincere attempt to talk about um, a form of nutrition that obviously has many benefits. Uh, but, but when it's done in that way, it's pretty bad. And, and we probably won't have time to go into it today, but you, you, I thought did such a great job of going into some of the real challenges of that, um, which, at, at a level that most people didn't right? like a lot of the criticisms of that movie are so obvious and easy, but you actually went deep in them. So we'll make sure people, people, um, go and look at that. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.